three things to cover today, sort of. First off, my wife kinda left me. Second thing is, I almost died, sort of. And this Sunday is Palm Sunday. So where to start? Well, I think the first thing is to get some fresh coffee and let's talk. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and I've been teaching around the world in various seminaries for the past 20 years. And the goal of this channel is to help you go deeper in your understanding of the Bible by taking what I've been teaching in the classrooms and making it available on YouTube. So if you find these videos useful, please take a moment and do something for me for free. Subscribe and give it a thumbs up. I always love reading your comments as well if you want to put one down below. Well, where to start? I put the three topics in my hat and I'm gonna draw them out in random order here. Okay, so the first one. I almost died this week. This is the reason why I'm doing a slightly less biblical video today. Three days ago, I was riding my bike along, minding my own business, having a great time. And I'm coming down a hill on a four lane road and I see this car parked along the curb there. And it turns on its turn signal like it wants to get out into the road. So I move over a little bit into the middle of the road. I guess he was waiting for a gap in the traffic because all of a sudden he guns a U-turn and went square into the side of his car, flipped over the back of his car and my bike as I saw the asphalt rapidly approaching my face, I had one of those instant flashbacks. And I remembered one of those urban legends about Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris doesn't do push-ups. He pushes the earth down. And I decided to imitate Chuck at that moment. Guess it only works for Chuck. Luckily, I got away just fairly banged up and bruised. No major injuries. But it meant that I was pretty uncomfortable for the past couple of days. Sleeping was the toughest thing. Trying to find a side of the body that was comfortable to lay on. And it meant I didn't get much sleep for the past two nights. And as a result, I was pretty tired during the day. I just have one big bruise left and it's on my hip over here. The bummer is I can't show it to you. What's the use of having a great battle scar if you can't show it to everyone on YouTube? The bike didn't fare so well though. It looks like it's pretty well totaled. And once again, I'm really thankful for good insurance on both his part and mine. It looks like they're gonna cover the cost for a replacement bike. Okay, on to choice number two here. Ah, my wife left me. Retirement is slowly sneaking up upon us and stalking us with ever greater vigilance. And my wife and I decided that it would be great if she would have the opportunity to do a medical missions trip while still employed. I've always been the one to go on different trips and teach around the world. So I thought it was great for her to have a chance to help others this time. She left for Honduras about a week ago to work at a medical surgical center in Honduras. Now I've gotten the chance to teach there and I love Honduras and the people and they have an absolutely gorgeous country. But Honduras has been hit by a series of catastrophes in recent years and they have a great need for work like this. She's working at a really large orphanage and medical clinic run by the Catholic Church about two hours north of the capital. Yesterday, she told me about a man who was a little bit older than us who needed pre-surgical checkup. And while she was doing his physical, she noticed that his heart didn't sound right. So she ran an EKG on him and it turns out that he has AFib. This really hits home to me because I have AFib as well. But what this means is that he has to wait for surgery as they try and get his heart under control and put him on blood thinners to control blood clots. Now here I am getting great care for my heart and there he is just being diagnosed for it for the first time, probably with limited care for how it will be controlled in the future as well. We don't get to choose where we are born, what time in history we were born, 
our gender, our family, our health. Yet we like to think that so much of who we are and what we have is ours. When in reality, we are just a short blink of an eye in the span of life upon this earth. I'm reminded of the saying that we have precious little time, but that the time that we do have is precious. And so we need to thank God for what we do have, no matter who we are or where we are. This leaves us with just this Sunday's reading from the Liturgy of the Passion, which is taken from Luke 22 and 23 this year. And to tell you the truth, I have to confess that I did a fair amount of research on this passage, but I've had little to no time preparing what to say or what to focus on in this video. So please excuse me for my lack of preparation for this video. But what I would like to do is share an observation that I noticed as I was working on this passage, something that I had not noticed before and it caught my attention. In his gospel, Luke shows a great deal of interest in food and meals in his gospel. And I covered why meals were so important during that time in an entire series. I think I've got four videos up on that and I'll have a link to it up over here and underneath the video down below. It's incredibly important to understanding Jesus' message and ministry. Many of these themes about meals come to a climax in the final meal that Jesus shares with his disciples. If you have a Bible, turn to Luke 22, 14. I'm not going to have time to read the passage. I'm just going to refer to it. When the time came for Jesus' last meal with his disciples, in 22, 14, we're told that he reclined at a table with them. When it talks about that they reclined at a table, it's talking about a triclinium, where you would have sort of like three benches with a cushion on top. Heads would be to the inside, feet to the outside, and there would be a common serving table in the middle. This means you would have five or six people on each side of the triclinium, at least. It's a very close and intimate eating situation. It's not like we sit today where we sit at a table and we've got our space here and our plates. No, you're on your side and the other person is right here, right next to you. At the start of this meal, Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you, 2215. And you get this picture of a very close meal. They are all laying side by side with each other, reclining on the triclinium. And you see Jesus' love and concern for his followers. At the same time, though, you get this tinge of grief and sorrow introduced. I have desired to eat this meal with you before I suffer. Then you get this promise. And I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. We know what it means in hindsight, but imagine being one of the 12 disciples. They're probably all scratching their head and thinking, huh, what the heck is this guy talking about? Close, intimate table fellowship like this was the way that they established community and strengthened lines of relationships. And notice how Jesus builds upon this by encouraging them to take this cup and divide it among yourselves, verse 17. Not drinking out of their own cups, but a single cup that's being passed around, it must have made a very deep impression upon them. He then takes some bread, prays, and breaks it, and passes it around to them as well. And following Paul, Luke records, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And just to let you know, I also have a video on the Lord's Supper. I'll have a reference up over here and down below. And you can take a look at that because 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is the earliest record of the communion meal or the Lord's Supper that we have. Finally, Jesus takes the cup again. Yes, I know. Luke goes cup, bread, cup. And I might have to do a video on that sometime in the future. But I digress. He takes the cup and then he says, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. At this point, the heads of the twelve must have been spinning. Do this in remembrance of me? The new covenant in my blood? What the heck is going on here? And the way Luke records this last meal for us, it's a story of gradual alienation of Jesus from his close friends and followers during the course of this meal. In verses 21 through 23, he reveals that one of them who are reclining at the table with them, eating the same food, drinking from the same cup, will betray him. As they're questioning and debating who this could be, it's interesting that Luke leads us into them arguing over who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. 
Now, wait a second, guys. Jesus just said one of you are going to betray me. And now you're having a debate about who's going to be the greatest. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. And it's the same for us in our lives. It's not about us. It's about God. The meal ends with Jesus turning to his closest and longest friend, Peter, and sadly informing him that before the morning comes, Peter is going to deny ever knowing Jesus three times. What struck me this week is how Luke paints a picture of the last meal, starting out with such close and intimate table fellowship. But as it progresses, we see Jesus being pulled away from his disciples. The coming alienation and suffering that he's going to have to endure during those final days on earth. All while partaking in what should have been a very close and warm fellowship over a shared meal with his best friends. It's really a very, very bittersweet story. And this is what I've been thinking about and why I wanted to share in this video. As I enter into this Passion Week leading up to Easter, I'm struck by just how emotionally costly that last meal was for Jesus and the 12 disciples, and that's just a small taste of what Jesus endured as he went to the cross. Until next week, remember, friends don't let friends run into cars on their bikes. Oh, wait, sorry. Until next week, I hope you have a memorable and meaningful Easter celebration. Peace.